Thank you. Well, thank you. It's always a delight, a privilege to be at Calvary Chapel, and we're grateful for this opportunity. You know, the title of this conference, as I see it, is The Wisdom of the Ages. And I suppose various people have already remarked how appropriate it would be to cause it the wisdom of the aged. <laughs> <laughs> but now, if you think you couldn't have an older, more aged speaker than Chuck Smith or Dave Hunt, you're looking to the proof you can. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I, and that, you know, in all the years that I've been studying the Bible and, and speaking, I've never spoken on this particular subject. My title is A Creationist Defense of the King James Bible. Now, the Bible has meant an awful lot to me, and this will be largely a personal testimony because I'm no authority. I never went to Bible college or seminary, so I, I don't have any technical knowledge of this other than what I've read. And so you'll have to take this as just my personal experience and testimony, but I have a long history of experience. You know, I, I'm way up in years now. I, I better... <laughs> Anyway, uh, I was saved when I was just a little child. That was a long, long time ago. Through reading the Bible, my mother gave me a Bible, and I began in Genesis, and I don't remember how far it was before I accepted Christ as Savior and have been a Christian ever since. But in college and high school, I got away from the Lord somewhat, became a theistic evolutionist. Now, that's an oxymoron, you know. <laughs> I didn't realize it at the time, and a lot of people think that evolution is God's method of creation, but of course, God would never do a thing like that. Evolution is the most... Uh, in the most foolish and wasteful and cruel way that you could ever think of which would produce man, and God wouldn't do that. So theistic evolution is, uh, it just couldn't be, and it isn't, and there's no evidence for it. There's not a, one iota of real scientific evidence for evolution. All the real evidence supports special creation just as taught in the Bible. And there's no scientific mistake in the Bible, not only on creation but anything else. There's many scientific truths in the Bible. Well, anyway, uh, I, I got away from the Lord during that time, but after graduating from college, from Rice University there in Texas, and it was a thoroughly secularistic school, just like all the others I've been with. I've taught in five different secular universities, as well as uh, going to two of them for my own work. And uh, they're all secular, but uh, at any rate, after getting away finally, I began to read the Bible once again and came back to the Lord through the Bible. That's why the Bible means so much to me. Whether it's King James or some other version, the, the Bible is true regardless. It's the Word of God. Now. I don't have anything much against other versions. I'm not a King James only type, like Chuck Smith says he isn't either. And I think most of us uh, would agree with that. We, we don't say that you, you shouldn't read another way. I've got about 40 different translations in my own little library, and I've used them. But the King James is the best. It's the most uh, reliable, the most, I think the most accurate, the most powerful, and the most beautiful by all standards of uh, real application. And I would recommend it because I've been using it all these years. I, soon after we got, well, when we got married, I, my wife and I were given as a wedding present, and this was 61 plus years ago. We're, we, have, we celebrate our 61st anniversary last January. And so at that time we were married a long time ago, the pastor gave us a copy of the American Standard Version of 1901. And I've used it all these years, and I have it. And then as time went on, I, I found that, that didn't spit like the King James did with so many things. So I just use it to, to refer to now and then. But then I began to look forward to other versions that were coming out. I began, I read, read into several of them. We got, I got a copy of the Phillips and the, and the Berkeley and so many, and Williams and so many others. And they all had certain value and I've used them and still do to some degree, but uh, always I go back to the King James. The Bible, to me, was and is still the King James Bible. Now, I, I look forward to the public, particularly there was a great deal of promotion concerning the publication of the Revised Standard Version. Here was a big committee of theologians, like there had been back in the days of King James. They were going to gather together and produce a new up-to-date version of all the great scholars and so forth. And so I looked forward to that, and I got it, and used it a bit, but then, no, that wouldn't do either. And then there began to be many others. And you know, I don't know whether you know how many different translations there are. I was surprised to find this, but there is a book published in 1990 by a man by the name of William Chamberlain, I think, in which he listed and described all of these that have been published in English since the time of Wycliffe, way back in the, what, 16th century or whenever it was. And uh, believe it or not, there are, b before the King James Bible was published, there were 16 complete Bible translations published. 
the one that influenced the King James more than any was the was the uh, Tyndale Bible, and to a large degree, and I have a copy of that by the way, and the and the King James translators use that quite a bit in in their version, but there were 16 Bibles and 28 New Testaments. Then after the King James Bible, 1611, and then there were a few other uh, edited versions of that over several period, a period of several years. But then after that, at the time this was, book was published in 1990, there were had been 120 more Bibles and 265 more New Testaments. So that altogether, there have been something like 140 or so complete Bible translations published and 300 new, complete New Testaments published in English, not to mention the other languages. Why so many? What's the need for so many, many? Just in my own lifetime, there have been over 40 new translations of the Bible published. Why? I don't know. You can't help but wonder if maybe money or ego or some other factors had to do with it other than just the need for a new translation. And there are others being prepared right now. And I don't quite understand what the need for that is because the old King James Bible has met the need of 12 generations of people for 400 years or more. And what's so different about the 13th generation that makes us need a new one right now? Don't understand. Well, of course, many people prefer it. Some, we, some churches use the NIV, some use the NASV, some use the NKJV, and some use the RSV, and all, all different churches, all different uh, versions. And I wouldn't do like some do, say that you should never use anything but the King James, and some will even say that the King James translation is divinely inspired. No, I think that some of the words could have been translated better here and there, particularly as it deals with creation. I th- that, but, you know, you could take any of them, and you can still not find anywhere in any of them, maybe one or two in Genesis 1-1, they've messed up, messed up that a little bit, one or two of them have. But otherwise, you can find no hint of evolution in any of the translations. And furthermore, you can find your way to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior in any of them. So by all means, read, uh, read some Bible, no matter which, but the King James is the best, <laughs> and you don't want to use that one. That's my opinion. Well, anyway, let me uh, give you some of the reasons why I, I say that. In fact, I've listed seven reasons why I think the King James is the best. Not just because I'm a creationist. As I said, you can find creationism and you can't find evolution in any of them. There's just nothing that translators could do to get evolution into the Bible. It's just not there. And so uh, it really isn't def- imperative and definitive for a creationist to believe, be in the, to believe in the King James as the best. Although I have written the book saying that I defend the King James Version. And the reason I wrote this little booklet is because in our work, you know, we publish a, a devotional guide, Days of Praise, a quarterly devotional book, little studies of, of some Bible doctrine or a passage or something each day. And we publish the Acts and Facts with biblical studies and scientific studies every month. These are free, by the way, and if you want to get on the mailing list for that, there's a mailing list sheet out there as well as some sample copies of those. You can do that. And we always use the King James, and so I've had many people written to me, you, you people are scientists and you try to keep up with science. Why don't you keep up with the new, new versions? Why do you always use the King James? And so that's the reason I wrote this. I didn't write it because that was my hobby horse or anything. It's just because people are asking it. And so that's the reason I wrote the little booklet. And other people then have asked me to let them republish it, reprint it, and so forth. And various ones have done that, so it's gotten around a little bit. And I guess that's why they asked me to speak on it here, because otherwise uh, I never, never do that. Anyway, what are the reasons why I believe the King James is the, is the best? Well, one is because of the translators. I think the ones who translated the King James Bible were the greatest assemblage of real biblical scholars that has ever been brought together in human history to translate a a Bible into English. I wouldn't say about the others, but I think at least as far as English translations are concerned, they're they're at least the equal and I think superior to any of the modern committees that have been used to develop the NIV or the NASV or any of the others. These King James translators were all Anglicans, of course, but that was a period in England when the Anglican church was true to the Word of God as they understood it. They, of course, they, uh, they didn't uh, baptize by immersion like I think they should have done. And there are a few other things, but in terms of believing the Bible to be the Word of God, and in terms of the inerrancy of the Bible, and in terms of literal six-day creation, all of them believe that. And so they, and they prayed deeply about it. I think Brother Smith mentioned this morning, one of the 47 translators, there were 54 to begin with, but several of them died during the seven years they were working on it. 
but the uh, 47 who su survived and who contributed throughout that period, one of the most important was a man by the name of John Boyes, who was the one who left the, more, uh, the greatest account of what took place during those years, how they went about their translation and so forth. And Brother Chuck Smith did discuss some of that this morning. Boyes was a great scholar, as uh, was mentioned. He had read the Hebrew Bible when he was just five years old. I can't even comprehend it. I, I'm, four, I'm older than five, a little older than five years old, and I've never read it. And I doubt if you have either. I don't know, most of you. But five years old, and then he became extremely fluent in Greek and in all of the biblical languages, practically. And was a, in fact, all of these men were high officials, either in Cambridge or Oxford or one of the other great British universities at the time, or in the Anglican Church in the denomination. They were all tremendous scholars. Every one of them were extremely fluent in the biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew, and boys was... Uh, was fluent in both Koine and Classical Greek. And I think probably most of the others were too. Many of them in the cognate languages, all of them practically in the church fathers and all of their quotations from the, from the Bible. And they spent years, all in, seven years all together, doing nothing else but just translating the Bible. So they devoted a long period of their lives to it. And they were tremendous scholars. And all of them, without any exception, believed in, in the inerrant inspiration of the Bible in special literal creation, and so on. And God blessed that. And I don't think that's been true altogether of any modern committee. Now, some of them have been quite liberal. Some of the translators have been quite liberal. For example, those that did the Revised Standard Version. And even those that did the English Revised Version under Westcott and Hart have been quite liberal. Some of them not even born-again Christians. And many of them, even on those that were the most uh, devout, Bible-believing Christians did not believe in literal creation, recent creation. They had some modified theory. And many people will say, well, what difference does that make? Why would we have to believe in literal creation? Well, I would say this, and, and I understand that you, why one could want, raise that question, but it does seem to me that any Bible-believing Christian who really believes the Bible is going to clearly understand the Bible teaches literal six-day creation. All the other theories are means of accommodating current scientific philosophies or theories. And so men who are going to accommodate the Bible in their interpretation to some man-made theory are not going to be very reliable in any aspect of Bible interpretation or even translation. Seems like that to me. So I think God would more, more deeply honor and use those men who are completely devoted to the, to the inspiration and the absolute integrity and truth of the Word of God than to some committee of those who were not, no matter what, how great their scholarship. But as a matter of fact, the King James translators were as, at least as great scholars as any of the others. They were tremendous men of God and men of academic integrity and knowledge and ability, and God used them, and no wonder the Bible has lasted for 400 years. Well, not only were they the better translators, but I think they had better manuscripts to translate than the modern translators have. As Brother Chuck Smith said this morning, most of the modern versions from the time of the English Revised Version to the American Standard Version on into Moffat and Goodspeed and all of the, those, Weymouth and all, and then more recently the uh, Revised Standard Version, and now even the NIV and, the, and all, practically all the others with one or two exceptions, they have followed the so-called Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament and the Kittel Biblia Hebraica for the Old Testament. Now these are supposedly better manuscripts than the ones on, that the King James translators use. They use the what's known as the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, for the Greek. It's also called the Majority Text. And for the Hebrew, they use the Masoretic Text. And I don't have time, I don't think I should take the time to go into that in detail. I don't know that much about it in the first place. But the it is true that as far as the Greek is concerned, the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, or the Majority Text, it's also called the Byzantine Text, coming out of the East, the Byzantium, and the Greek churches all use that, of course, have used it in, in maintaining the, the integrity of their belief through the ages. That is by far the Majority Text. You see, the, according to the information I've been able to get of the Greek manuscripts, there are a total of 5,255 Greek manuscripts available. Now, those are handwritten, of course. These were all written before the advent of the printing press. That's how the Bible had to be transmitted down to, until that time. 
And so they had to be carefully and laboriously recopied by hand. And because it was the Word of God, and these people who were doing the copying, particularly in the East, were very devout, and they respected the Word of God deeply, they wanted to be sure it was right, and so they, were, they tried to be very, very careful. And that's why the great majority of the, of the texts that have come down have been uh, the text, what now is called the Texas Receptus, 5,255 total. And of those, 5,210 constitute what's, co- what's been used to get the Texas Receptus. So they're only about 1% that have been used as the basis for the Westcott Hart division of textual criticism and translation. But, of course, it's, it's said that because these, some of these uh, m- minority texts are older than the majority texts, therefore that makes them more likely to be true because they're older, more close, closer to the original source. But that doesn't necessarily follow, obviously. The fact that they're old doesn't mean that they're better. I'm old, and I'm not better than I used to be, I guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, you see... You can, you can see this, that if, if a text is a good text and the churches are using it and you know, keep using it and keep studying it, and finally it's going to wear out, and so they've got to copy it before it completely goes. And so the texts that are being used, because they're good, they wear out. And so that's why there's so many more of the good texts, because they had to keep copying and recopying, whereas these others that are not so good, they would not be used very much for that very reason. For example, the two that are most commonly cited and that were the main basis of the Westcott and Hart Greek New Testament were the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus manuscripts. And as Brother Smith mentioned this morning, both of those are derived from the so-called Alexandrian branch of the Christian church, the Egyptian branch, under particularly Clement and Origen, who were completely indebted to Greek philosophy for, to try to co- uh, compromise the Christian faith with philosophy, just like modern Christians often will try to compromise Christianity with evolution, much of the same thing, because Greek philosophy was also evolutionary. And so, and so the, the older manuscripts didn't get used as much, and consequently they lasted longer. The Vaticanus manuscript that they found in the basement of the Vatican Library, and nobody seems to know just how long it's been there, where it came from, except it does follow this Egyptian branch. The Sinaiticus manuscript, they say, was found in a wastebasket in a, in a monastery on Mount Sinai, one of the Orthodox uh, churches over there. The priests or the, mon- the monks there had this ancient manuscript. Apparently they hadn't used it in years because it was just not being used. It was even in a wastebasket when a man by the name of Tischendorf found it on a trip to the, uh, to the east, to the Middle East. And he publicized it quite widely and he maintained that it was better because it was older, but as a matter of fact, the, t- the Vatican, Vaticanus manuscript and the Sinaiticus manuscript have many deletions, as Brother Smith mentioned this morning. They leave, both leave out the last part of Mark 16. They both leave out the first number of verses, about nine verses of John chapter 8, and many, many other places where they've left out one or two verses. And as a matter of fact, the Vaticanus manuscript has left out whole books of the Bible. Most of Genesis was omitted, and I think all of Revelation and several of the Psalms. And furthermore, they disagreed with each other in many places. So it's amazing that they've been taken as the norm for translating and for getting out a a modern Greek manuscript, which is so deficient, but which has been made the basis of so many of the modern translations. The Textus Receptus, on the other hand, has uh, over 5,000 manuscripts. And although there's some little differences here and there, because nobody is perfect in the copying, and there were a few little questions and mistakes, but they were, for for the most part, very careful and they copied carefully and they preserved a good text which was used during the Reformation by Martin Luther and by all the others, and then finally by Wycliffe and Tyndale, and finally then the English King James Committee in the, in the time of James I of England. And incidentally, just parenthetically maybe, but I think it's also relevant in terms of what I said before, Tischendorf was himself a liberal evolutionist, the one who found the Sinaiticus manuscript and who promoted it, and so was Westcott, and so was Hart, and so were those who followed them and modified their, uh, man, their Greek text a little bit, like uh, Eberhard Nessel, Kurt Aland, and then also in, when the American Revision Committee took the English Revised Version and wanted to make an American Standard Version and change it a little bit, the chairman of the committee in this country was Philip Schaff, who is also a liberal and a theologian who is an evolutionist, a theistic evolutionist, and he got on, the, on his committee, he got uh, 
a number of evolutionists. For example, there were two Unitarians, Joseph Thayer of Harvard University and who was the other one? Uh, Ezra Abbott, both of them Unitarians of Harvard, and they, in turn there were a number of other theistic evolutionists on the committee. And I just naturally, I guess, from my perspective, think that they can't really be relied upon to make a good translation when they interpret Genesis in a way that obviously wasn't intended by the writer. And so many of the others, even the ancient Greek authorities like Origen, who were responsible for the Alexandrian stream of texts, finally the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and others, he also was an evolutionist because he was compromising Christianity with Greek philosophy, as I've shown in my book, The Long War, Greek philosophy, both the Gnostic philosophy and the Epicurean and the Gnostic and all the others back through Aristotle and Socrates and back on to Thales and all the others were all evolutionists. Not Darwinian evolutionists, of course. They were after Charles Darwin, but none of them believed in a, an, an omniscient creator who created all things in the beginning. They all believed that the universe was eternal. The idea that the, that the earth is very old, you see, is not some new discovery of science. This was believed by all of ancient paganism. And the idea that, of a recent literal creation is unique to the revelation that God gave through Moses and the others who wrote the Old Testament and then the New Testament. And finally, as we have it today in our book of Genesis. And so the, the fact that a, a manuscript may be old doesn't at all mean that it's necessarily the best. I think the other is much more likely to be true. Well, that's a couple of the reasons. Another reason is the beautiful language of the King James. Now, it may have some archaic expressions and some words that have changed and so forth, and these can be handled in footnotes without any problem, and I've done that in my Defender's Bible, of course, so that uh, there's no reason why those few that are a little bit hard to understand, you, you can't uh, work that out. But in terms of the language as a whole in the King James, there's no, no other version that's as all comparable in terms of beauty and majesty and spiritual power, I think, than the, than the King James. I remember you, when I was teaching at Virginia Tech a number of years ago, well, long years ago, I left, left there 30 years ago. <laughs> But uh, during that time, I had a daily, or rather a weekly column in the county newspaper called The Bible Has the Answer. Later collected all of those and came a book called The Bible Has the Answer. Anyway, uh, one of the questions that people asked was, should we abandon the King James Version? Some of these others were just beginning really to be popular about 30 years ago. And my answer to that in the column said, no, we shouldn't abandon it. It gave some of the reasons. And I remember walking across the campus one day, and the man who was dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dean Johnson, his name was, as far as I know, was not a... Christian, at least I didn't know anything about his, his he, he was not, not in any of the Christian fundamental churches I knew of anyway, but he stopped me and said, he just wanted to thank me for defending the beautiful old King James Version. He said, just as a piece of literature, it needs to be used and read and, and known by people everywhere. And he just thanked me for writing on that subject. And let me read a, another statement or two along that line. In the, in the book, writing in all the literature of the world, Many learned but misguided men have sought to produce translations that should be mathematically accurate and in the plain speech of every day, but the authorized version has never yielded to any of them, for it's palpably and overwhelmingly better than they are. Its English is extraordinarily simple, pure, eloquent, and lovely. It's a mine of lordly and incomparable poetry, at once the most stirring and the most touching ever heard of. H.L. Mencken said that. Others would say that, uh, well, the King James is so complicated. But th this is another statement from the book, The Story of English. The King James Bible was published in the year Shakespeare began work on his last play, The Tempest. Both the play and the, and the Bible are masterpieces of English, but there is one crucial difference between them. Whereas Shakespeare ransacked the lexicon, the King James Bible employs a bare 8,000 words, God's teaching in homely English for every man. From that day to this, the Shakespearean cornucopia and the biblical iron rations represent, as it were, the north and south poles of the language, reference points for writers and speakers throughout the world, from the Shakespearean splendor of a Joyce or a Dickens to the biblical rigor of a Bunyan or a Hemingway. In other words, the Bible was not written for scholars, not translated for scholars, although there were great scholars who did the translation, but rather for every man because it was desired that every man in England and in America would have access to the Word of God and be able to understand it. And that's why I think that the greatest defenders today of, a mo of the modern versions are the intellectuals. The everyday person who just loves the Bible because it's the Bible, he loves the King James because he understands it. I remember when, when my children were little, I had six children, and we, we twice a day we'd gather around the table, breakfast and, and supper, 
and I'd read some, some from the Bible, then we'd have prayer, and discuss it, and then have prayer. And I read the King James, of course, that's what we had. They didn't have any trouble understanding it. <laughs> and, but you know, from time to time, I would bring another one, particularly when I was thinking, maybe, well, maybe the Revised Standard or one of these others, will, they'll understand it better. And so we'd try that. But almost invariably, it was, uh, became obvious that these newer versions were more difficult to follow by the children than the King James was. And that is because I believe that the King James language was deliberately made simple for everybody. For example, well, take for example Ephesians 2.8. Notice, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Yourselves is the first word of more than one syllable. Not of yourselves, but is the gift of God, not of works, lest any, there's another two syllable word, man should boast. And I found that all through the King James all the words were either one or two syllables with very, very few exceptions. And the others are often phrased in rather uh, uh, nice academic language that are a little, really, uh, and those that have actually made systematic statistical studies of the reading level of these different versions. For example, all of them have indicated the King James language level is a 10th grade or lower, and the most recent one that I've read was just uh, two or three years ago, a computerized study of how many words of one, more than one syllable, how many words in the, in the sentence, and all the way, other ways that they use to measure the reading level, whatever they are, those who are specialists in this. And they found that the reading level of the King James Version was the 6.5 grade, halfway between the 6th and the 7th grade. So certainly anybody in high school ought to be under, able to understand the King James Bible without any difficulty, whatever, if they're at all <laughs> uh, literate and can read uh, at all. They should be able to do that. So there's nothing difficult to understand or to read or to, under, or to comprehend about the King James Version as far as any uh, formal statistical measures are concerned. And then this question about so many, suppose we do decide, well, we, we'd really better have a modern translation, get rid of the these and the thous and so on. And by the way, you know that the these and the thous had a purpose that we've lost in the modern version. I guess some of you know, maybe not everybody, that they, they use... You know, we have a, have a different word for singular and plural, whether it's, for example, I and we in the first person, but in the second person, it's, it's always you now. You did this, or it's yours or something, whether it's one, one person or two people. But in the King James, if it was thee or thou or thine, it was dealing with one person, talking about one person, thee. If you if they use the word thee, and you'll find the word you frequently in the King James, of course, it was for more than one person. So if you put them all into the form of you or yours, well, then you miss a lot of the fine points of interpretation of what the writer was saying in, in the actual verse. And the other so-called archaic ways of writing things in the King James, they had reason for it. And we've lost some of that in our modern versions. Well, just in summary, I think that uh, one good reason for retaining the King James is the beauty of expression and the simplicity of expression ease of understanding its expression, the most beautiful, the most spiritually powerful, I think, of any of the versions that have ever been published. Maybe there'll be a better one someday, but I don't see any prospect of it right now. And so uh, that's why, one of the reasons why I recommend the King James. But if we do decide, well, you, we must have another modern translation just to be modern and up to date. We want to all be modern. Then which one are you going to use? <laughs> now you've got real confusion because the pastor will read from one, and the people in the pews will have all their own different versions, and the sum total is you can't have congregational reading. You have to project it on the screen so that everybody can have the same thing, and therefore people don't need to bring the Bible to church because they're not going to be using it anyway. And another factor is, and this was one of the reasons, just about the, the art of memorization of the Bible has just about been forgotten because if it doesn't matter what it's, it, it really says all different versions say different things about each verse. How do you know which one to memorize and what's the point since another one might be different? I remember memorizing the scripture has been a great blessing to me over the years. I began memorizing scripture way back when I was uh, teaching at Rice University back during World War II. And Dawson Trotman, the founder of the Navigators, came to town. I was active in the Gideons at the time. Still am a member. And the Gideons, of course, try to get the Bible out as widely as they can and try to lead people to Christ, and that also was a great blessing to me. They used the King James, and they, uh, Dawson Trotman came to town, and he, he spoke to our Gideon camp, and he 
taught us to memorize in Scripture. Well, of course, he had the navigators, and he taught them how to memorize Scripture. And I was teaching Navy students at Rice at the time, so I began to do that with the, with the students there. But also in the Gideon camp, I was the chaplain, so I got them to doing it. And it was a great blessing to me and to the, and to the students and to the men in the Gideons to start memorizing Scripture. And I remember Dawson Trotman would say, when you memorize, it's so important to have the right address and the word, have it word perfect. To use that phrase over and over, have it word perfect. Be sure you say it exactly like it's written. And then give the address in front of it and back of it, fore and aft. And so we, we learned that. And of course, Dawson Trotman isn't with us anymore, but I just wonder what he would think about the situation now. Not only people in general, but the navigators and everybody else just doesn't do that anymore because what's the use? Why try to be word perfect with a verse when every translation has the words different? So uh, again, we've lost the art of memorization, which is such a blessing. Thy word have I hid in my heart, David said, that I might not sin against thee. So many references to memorizing the Bible, memorizing verses of the Bible. Yeah, I better get on to my other reasons for it. I have to close here. <laughs> one very important reason, I think. Well, with respect, let me read one other quotation about the uh, multiplication of versions. That's the problem, and you don't know which one to use. This is from a very, very recent article. I just picked it up this week. In the May issue of First Things, this is by Richard Newhouse, who's the editor of the journal, I think. He's a Catholic, I think. He's quoting somebody else here. He says, if I had the authority, declared the leader of an evangelical parachurch empire, I'd almost be ready to decree that we go back to the King James. And Newhouse says, that was in response to my having written here that if I had the authority, everybody would use the Revised Standard Version. But the sorry fact is that English-speaking Christians have largely lost a common bi biblical vocabulary as a consequence of the proliferation of translations and of paraphrases passing as translations over the last 40 years. I'm told that there are nearly 200 English translations on the market now. I suppose that means there are 100 that have gone out of print because there were 300 altogether. And Bible printers keep churning out new ones, for there seems to be a near insatiable market. Always new translations. Somehow we're not satisfied. But the King James is still the bestseller of all of them. And it keeps on coming out because there are many people who see like I do that it's the most reliable. And here's another reason now. for, And that's because it is the most reliable. And by that I mean it was based on the principle of literal equivalency of the words rather than dynamic equivalency of the thoughts. And that's a popular idea that's been around the past 30 years or so. The idea of dynamic inspiration or dynamic equivalency is not the words that are important, but the thought behind the words. Well, my question is, how can you have a precise thought transmitted if you don't have precise words to transmit that precise thought? Well, anyway, dynamic equivalency was the basis of the new NIV and many of the other modern versions, certainly of the Living Bible and New Living Translation, many others like that. What's the difference? Well, the literal equivalency is that the translators deliberately tried to translate the words so that we'd get in English the exact words that were in Greek or Hebrew, as the case might be, literal equivalency. And that's honoring to the principle of verbal inspiration. We say we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible, the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible. That's what the Bible teaches, that not just the thoughts, but the words are inspired. For example, I think Chuck Smith quoted 2 Timothy 316, the most familiar passage, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, to proof, for correction, instruction in righteousness, and so on. All scripture. All scripture. So that's plenary inspiration, not just part of it or some of it or here and there, but all of it. Not just the spiritual matters and the, and the historical and scientific parts you maybe question. No, but all scripture. Plenary inspiration. Then he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Scripture means writings, all the writings. The words written down, not the thoughts, but the words actually written down, the writings are inspired. That's verbal inspiration. Or given by inspiration of God, that's one word in the Greek, God breathed. Given by inspiration of God, God breathed, one word, the apneustis. That is, God literally breathed out these words. They were divinely revealed. The words were written by God. Not all of them were mechanically dictated, like some passages in Leviticus, for example. But nevertheless, the end result of the words that Peter and Paul and Moses and the others used, using their own studies and own research and their own abilities to write them down, yet God had given those, them those abilities and those abilities and their research and so forth. And so what the final result was that the actual words, every one of them were 
breathed out by God, the Holy Spirit. The holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So there's no private interpretation in the scriptures. And of course, there are many other, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Till heaven and earth passes, there's not one jot or one tittle of the law shall pass away, till all be fulfilled. And so the words are transmitted, the King James translators deliberately tried as best they could, not only to produce a beautiful translation, which would sing as it were, that's what they were actually commissioned to do, and they did it so that their, actually their, their King James language is better than any one of them could have written. Somehow all of them coming together were able to produce this beautiful, most eloquent of all English Bibles, or English books really, that ever have been written. And so all the words were inspired as, and as well as beautifully done, and they were true to the literal words of the, of the Greek and the Hebrew language. And not only were they inspired in their first writing, but the Bible tells us that they were preserved. For example, Psalm 12, 6, I think, says that every word of God is or pure, or all the words of God are pure, as pure as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. God shall keep them forever. God shall preserve them from this generation forever. So he's not only inspired them, but he's going to preserve them. And so it's unthinkable to me that for many centuries during the Middle Ages, when there was nothing available but the, when the Alexandrian text, based on the, with the Sinaiticus, that wasn't available to people, and they didn't have access to the real word of God then, if God was not preserving it for those generations. But all through the generations, the Texas Receptus have been preserved by the copyists who were very faithful and very careful, but not only the Greek, but also the Hebrew, which I haven't really had time to go into, so that uh, what we have is faithfully transmitted the actual words of God, and the King James translators were careful to do that with their principle of literal equivalence. Psalm 119, 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. That's a marvelous verse. Thy word is settled in heaven, so whatever the Word of God is, it's permanently ens enshrined and inscribed in heaven, and we want to be as near to that as we can. And maybe, we, you know, I like to think of this possibility, too. This is just my own little interpretation, whatever that's worth. Uh, take it or leave it. When it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, how is that? Well, you know, when the Babylonians came in and, and conquered the people of Judah, and they took all the vessels of the temple away and the king and all the other the nobles away they took them into Babylon and took all, told all about the different things they took away from the temple but never says anything about the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of the Covenant somehow they didn't get that now we got people looking for it today they think they have an idea it might be in Egypt or Ethiopia or under the temple in Jerusalem or somewhere at any rate the Bible doesn't say but it does say that in that Ark of the Covenant we're in, we're in it were the tables of the law, Moses' writings. And I like to think maybe that the original autographs of the others, we don't have any of the autographs today, of course. I like to think that they were in there along with Moses' writings. And that just as God took Elijah and Enoch into heaven, he took the Ark of the Covenant into heaven. And the reason I say that is because in the book of Revelation, I think it's where the 11th chapter says, John saw the temple of God open in heaven. There he saw the Ark of the Covenant. So those who are looking, the Raiders of the Lost Ark or something, they're not going to find it here. It's up there. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that, but that's something you can... <laughs> anyway, what, somehow it's forever settled in heaven. And I think it's significant the very last chapter of the Bible says you better be careful with the words of God. Don't mess with them. Don, uh, John says, rather the Lord said, I, hear, I say to every man that hears the words of the book of this prophecy, if any man shall... Add unto these things, God's going to add unto these words, God's going to add unto him the plagues written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God's going to take his name out of the book of life and from the holy city and the things written in the book. Don't add to or take away from the words of the book, of the Bible. So it's important to have a literal translation as best you can. And you can have commentaries and explanations. If you think it's difficult to understand, you can do that. But don't tamper with the words of the Bible because it's easy to put our people to put their own thoughts into what they would like to say are the thoughts of the Bible if they use the principle of dynamic equivalency. Well, I've got to close. The, the other reason, two other reasons I haven't mentioned, one of them is that God has uniquely blessed this King James Bible. The others appear for a little time, last for maybe a half a generation or so, and then some other one. Take. But the King James has lasted for 12 generations, 400 years, still is lasting. God evidently has blessed it. This was the Bible that was being used by the great Missionaries, William Carey and Adoniram Judson and Hudson Taylor, and the great evangelists D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday, and for many years by Billy Graham even. 
and, and, and so on, and by the great churches, Spurgeon and the others. And the, uh, it's just blessed so many, many people, and God used it so greatly and so widely. Why would we want to change when we can still understand it? It's still easily understood and still a beautiful, the most beautiful of all. And the last reason, final reason, that's probably the least of all, is the blessing that's been in my own personal life. My children, my ministries, whatever I've had, and God's just blessed me for over 60 years now. Every day I've studied the Bible, the King James Bible, I've looked at the others too. <laughs> and it, I, just, I would just hate to see it fall into disuse because it's meant so much to me. Well, let me, I've got to close. Joshua 24, 15, you, you know this verse. Joshua said to the people of Israel as they were trying to conquer the land there. It says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then you choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Well, I'd like to paraphrase that a bit and maybe apply it a bit. If it seems evil to you to use the old version of the Bible, which God has blessed so much for 400 years, then you pick out the one you want, choose you this day what you want. But as for me and my house, I'm going to stick by the King James. 